Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Meng Chen, the uh, John A. Everson Dean of College of Engineering at Purdue. Uh, my sincere apology that uh, I wasn't a good enough engineer to work out how to join the event at 1.15. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to be able to say a few words to welcome all of you to the panel portion of today's uh, incredibly exciting uh, uh, distinguished uh, engineering lecturer here at the college. Uh, as you know that uh, Purdue Engineering, now the largest top 10 engineering college in the country, strives towards the pinnacle of excellence at scale as part of that. We uh, started uh, three years ago to invite about eight uh, most incredibly outstanding uh, and distinguished uh, uh, lecturers uh, to speak here in person, used to be, and now uh, online virtually and today we welcome dr mark lewis uh now you may have already heard uh, the introduction by bill crossley about mark lewis i'll try to be brief but i can uh, not to really refrain my enthusiasm just because what an incredible national treasure dr lewis has been what an outstanding colleague uh, he has also been i'll simply highlight uh, without reading his entire biography here, uh, three particular dimensions. One is that he is one of us in academia and served on Maryland's faculty for 25 years, including as the chair of the Department of uh, Aero Astro Engineering. And furthermore, he was the longest serving uh, chief scientist at the United States Air Force uh, and uh, had a, an indelible mark uh, and very positive impact uh, to anything that flies uh, and deep uh, knowledge about national defense and emerging technology, the subject of today's lecture. And thirdly, uh, last year, he was also the uh, deputy undersecretary of defense in charge of all the modernization, all the research and development of multiple agencies that we are very familiar with uh, and an incredible job as a leader uh, in our national defense ecosystem. And I had the chance to know uh, Dr. Lewis even prior to that, uh, uh, when he was the keynote at the Hypersonics uh, Summit in July 2019, and got to uh, work with him on a few different things last year. Uh, it is uh, such a great pleasure to welcome him to uh, the Purdue ecosystem uh, in ways more than one. And today, a uh, oh, fantastic privilege and honor to get to introduce, now that I can work WebEx uh, at three o'clock today, to introduce uh, doc, uh, Dr. Mark Lewis uh, to all of you and looking forward to the panel discussion here. And I think I should turn it now to Dan, who is moderating this panel with Dr. Lewis. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Mung. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Dan DeLaurentis, uh, one of the very uh, proud College of Engineering professors who uh, work in aerospace systems and, and hypersonics and areas uh, uh, that Dr. Lewis talked about so eloquently. I also direct our Purdue Institute of Global Security and Defense Innovation, in which uh, we've been able to work together with Mark and others to try to advance a, a whole front of national security efforts. Uh, so very gratified by uh, this uh, this day, day and a half that Dr. Lewis is spending with us. And my most important role here today is to actually introduce uh, a more effective moderator for the panel than myself, uh, and that is uh, Liz Benitez. Liz is a PhD student in Aero Astro, researching hypersonic instabilities related to boundary layer separation. Uh, given that, it will be no surprise that she studies under uh, Professor Steve Schneider and Joe Jewell. Uh, prior to starting her PhD studies at Purdue, she worked as a research engineer at GTRI and also earned a master's in aerospace engineering from Georgia Tech. And uh, she's currently, uh, as many of us are, uh, working remotely and finishing her PhD, uh, in her case, from Ohio with her, her uh, wonderful family. So, Liz, would you... Uh, Take us to the introduction of the panel. Yes, thanks, uh, Professor De Laurentiis. 
Um, so I'm going to uh, introduce um, the uh, the four professors that we have here today for the panel. So uh, first, uh, Professor Jonathan Paji. Uh, he received his uh, Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Rhode Island in 1988. He earned his Master's and PhD degrees in Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering from Princeton University. After graduating from Princeton in 1995, he joined the Air Force Research Laboratory, where he worked as a research engineer until 2015. He's currently a professor in the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics at Purdue. Dr. Paji has a very broad research experience with publications in the experimental, theoretical, and computational aspects of fluid dynamics and plasma physics. His work has been supported financially by AFOSR, ONR, and AFRL, and by grants of supercomputer time under the DOE Insight Award and the DOD Frontier Project. He is an ASME fellow and an AIAA associate fellow. Um, Next up is uh, Professor Carol Handwerker. She is a uh, Reinhardt Schumann Junior Professor of Materials Engineering and Environmental and Ecological Engineering at Purdue. Uh, before joining Purdue in 2005, she served as the chair of the NIST Metallurgy Division, where she started her career as an NRC postdoctoral fellow, following her PhD in Materials Science and Engineering from MIT. And I didn't mention, I, I also am an MIT alum for my bachelor's, so it's neat to see so many alum here from there too. Um, her research areas include uh, developing innovative technologies for next generation microelectronics and solar cells, improving the reliability of lead free solder and turn to connects, particularly uh, for high performance military and aerospace electronic applications, among several other topics. Professor Handwerker is a member of the DOE Critical Materials Institute leadership focused on accelerating technology transfer of CMI R&D and recycling, reuse and remanufacturing. Um, she is also a co-PI of a major DoD program and is leading recently announced $40 million five-year DoD program in facility, facilitating the transition to lead-free electronics and defense system. Uh, next up, we have Professor Jennifer Neville. She is the Samuel D. Kant Professor of Computer Science and Statistics at Purdue. She received her PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst in 2006 and was PC Chair of the SIAM International Conference on Data Mining in 2019 and the ACM International Conference on Web Search and Data in 2016. From 2015 to 2018, she was an elected member of the AAI Executive Council, and in 2012, she was awarded an NSF Career Award. Uh, in 2008, she was chosen by IEEE as one of AI's 10 to watch, and in 2007, was selected as a member of the DARPA Computer Science Study Group. In her work, which includes 130 peer-reviewed publications with 10,000 citations, it focuses on developing machine learning and data mining techniques for complex relational and network domains, including social, informational, physical, and biological networks. And finally, we have Professor Stephen Heaster, who is the Riseback Distinguished Professor in the Departments of Aeronautics and Astronautics and Mechanical Engineering at Purdue. Professor Heaster earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in aerospace engineering from the University of Michigan, and he received his PhD in aerospace engineering from UCLA in 1988. He has work experience at Lockheed California Company and the Aerospace Corporation, where he spent the bulk of the 1980s. He's also spent time at TRW and Blue Origin as part of sabbatical visits. Professor Heaster is published extensively in the areas of chemical rocket and air breathing combustion, atomization, fuel propellant injection, injection dynamics, and system level studies of aerospace vehicle concepts, including detonation bias propulsion. Since 2014, Professor Heaster's group has focused on development of rotating detonation engine combustors with current AFOSR and DOE sponsored efforts along these lines. So um, that's just a little background. Everyone's, uh, all of these professors have, uh, it seems like extensive work uh, in defense related projects in addition to open source material. Um, and just to kind of get everyone started talking, um, I wanted to just uh, go down the line of uh, everyone here and just kind of ask in, in your field, what do you think is going to be the next game changing technology in terms of defense? So um, Professor Pachi, if you want to start Sure. <clears throat> well, I, I'm a big fan of uh, plasma-based flow control as maybe a game-changing, a possible game-changing technology. So uh, the advantages of that kind of technology is that you can do flow control actuation at uh, electronic timescales rather than mechanical timescales. So instead of, say, millisecond-level actuation, you can get to nanosecond-level actuation. And that would let us do things like uh, perhaps manipulate laminar tr turbulent transition at hypersonic speeds. Uh, so that's uh, that's the sh the short answer of my my uh, my game changer. Awesome, thanks. About um, Professor Handwerker. So my game changer is heterogeneous integration and advanced packaging. Uh, what's happening is we don't have 
just monolithic chips where you put all the information, all of the functionality into the chips. We need much more uh, flexibility. So there are these things called chiplets that are being developed and they have to be integrated in new ways that demand new materials, new performance and new designs. So heterogeneous integration and advanced packaging, the Department of Defense is uh, investing in, in this area as is the um, that's my technology. Awesome, thanks. Uh, thanks up, Professor Neville. Yeah, I think um, my game-changing technology is already happening and was mentioned by Mark Lewis earlier that uh, I think machine learning and AI systems are going to become more and more pervasive um, in, I think, the limitations that prevent these systems from becoming larger game changes are really um, issues that we have in combining together the systems into larger components uh, where multiple AI systems are used together in robust ways that are um, not only robust to adversaries, but also robust to unexpected uh, data and events. And so I think once we have the technology that can um, be allow our methods to be more flexible across new domains that haven't been seen before, we'll really start to see the, the game changing aspects of AI and machine learning. Awesome, thanks. And uh, last but not least, Professor Huster. Well, I'm, uh, I'm one who burns things. Uh, and in the, in the combustion propulsion area, uh, today's engines, we, we, we burn with what we call deflagration. Uh, which is a low, a low uh, velocity combustion, essentially at constant pressure conditions. Uh, the community is a growing interest in detonation based propulsion. And that's been an area I've been working, as you mentioned, um, uh, with the, uh, the promise of uh, not only increased thrust, but greatly reduced combustor size. Uh, and both of these things have a large uh, intersection uh, with aerospace and in particular with the hypersonic uh, uh, propulsion uh, aspects. Awesome. And uh, Dr. Lewis, um, I know you mentioned uh, like four key technologies in your lecture earlier, and maybe in, in case if anyone has joined who might have missed the lecture, if you want to uh, mention them. Sure. So, so I'm going to be your difficult panel member today. <laughs> I worry about the term game changer. It gets used a little bit too often. <laughs> Um, you know, there, there, there truly are some revolutions in technology and then there, you know, there are evolutions in technology. I happen to think that the field of hypersonics overall is as close to a game changer as you can get, just as I happen to think artificial intelligence is truly a game changer. Um, hypersonics, why is that important? Um, well, because it introduces, you know, speed maneuverability, it really changes the way you use technologies in the battlefield. Um, if I've got a hypersonic system, suddenly I've got a capability that has, you know, tactical applications with strategic inputs. Now, how do you do that? I, I you know, uh, 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 I think both, both, both Jonathan and Steve correctly alluded to elements of that, right? Propulsion advances, uh, flow control advances, right? Um, this, these are very, this is a very challenging regime in which to operate. I, I'd also say that the whole design aspects of a hypersonic vehicle, being able to integrate the engine with the airframe, uh, handling, you know, temperature loads on very sharp leading edges that are also extremely efficient aerodynamic configurations that enables these systems, then that create those, those opportunities. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you all. Um, so, uh, I guess I haven't seen any questions yet from the audience. So, uh, for people who have questions for any of the panel members, including Dr. Lewis, uh, you can ask those in the, the Q and A box down here, but I do have some questions to kind of get the discussions going uh, between all of the panelists. So, um, I have one uh, for um, Dr. Lewis and Professor Paji. Um, so, uh, Dr. Lewis, you mentioned uh, you called out ground test facilities and wind tunnels specifically during your lecture, which I was very happy to hear uh, since I, mm -hmm. I currently work in a wind tunnel. Um, yeah. And uh, I know there are other industries, for example, I think I read about Formula One are, are transitioning uh, exclusively to computational fluid dynamics and modeling and simulation and away from ground testing. Uh, and I was happy to hear you, you 
see that ground testing has a role in defense uh, in in the future anyway. Um, so I, I was wondering if uh, and Professor Paji, I know you work in modeling and simulation uh, working together with experimentalists as well. Um, so if the two of you might want to elaborate on how um, computational fluid dynamics and ground testing can support each other uh, in the, the field of defense. Jonathan, you want to go first, and then I'll, I'll sure, finish. sure. Well, I think we should approach prediction with humility, and especially um, today, which is the tenth anniversary of the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster. You know, we should reflect on that that we don't always know what's going to happen in a complicated system, and uh, so uh, I, um, I, I really think that there there has to be an integrated approach to prediction. So, um, as a former experimentalist, you know, I, in early in my career, I did wind tunnel experiments. Um, I have some perspective on that, and I, I'm, I'm very skeptical of both experiment and computation now, having done both. <laughs> um, so, I think what, what we get from uh, in this in this new situation is that if experiments are very expensive, like flight tests, um, we can't skip doing them. But by doing simulation beforehand, we can make very good use of our time. So we can pick what things we need to measure, you know, what areas have the greatest uncertainty, and uh, we can design experiments to um, try to tease out those pieces that we need to make the models better. So um, that that is one aspect of the work. Um, so I, I really am not an advocate of going to 100% simulation to design anything. And at some point you have to test, and this is the fundamental basis of science that you know the the real world is the test that we put our theory against, and we always have to make that test, that comparison, to keep ourselves honest. Uh, so that's uh, that's another aspect of it. And the final thing I'd like to say is that even though our models in say in fluid mechanics are very based very much on physics and chemistry, fundamental science is well known. Um, there are aspects of modeling that are based on rules of thumb and heuristics and a judgment, and so we we make approximations, we make assumptions about what's going on, and there many of those assumptions are not necessarily correct in all cases. So when we step outside the box that we're comfortable with, uh, we have problems. And uh, when I was at AFRL, I had some association with some flight tests like HDV2 and X51. And if you're familiar with the story of those flight tests, there were significant problems at various stages, and uh, very unexpected events. So um, we we have to uh, you know we have to consider that uh, that aspect of it. I'll, I'll hand it over to Mark. Well, John, I you know I couldn't have said it better. So so I like to point out there are deficiencies in both modeling and simulation and in ground test. Right? Let's talk about modeling and simulation. So if I'm if I if I've got a computer model, let's say I'm solving the fundamental equations of fluid motion. What I'm really doing is solving numerical approximations to those fundamental equations. And there are times when those fundamental equations actually fail in some of the regimes that that we deal with. Right, um, especially in hypersonic flight, um, the, our, the 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 basic equations of fluid motion, the Navier-Stokes equations, have failings. There are regions that they do not apply particularly well in parts of the hypersonic flight regime. Um, so every every numerical simulation is an approximation. At the same time, wind tunnels also have deficiencies. Real 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 vehicles flying in the atmosphere don't have walls on either side. Right, there are, there are are effects that we cannot simulate. So we use both of those tools to the best of our ability and use use each of their strengths and weaknesses to get a, a better understanding. Yeah, I, I, I love the example of, of both X51 and HTV2. So there's a great story about HTV2. Um, it was a DARPA Air Force project. Originally, the plan was to do no wind tunnel testing. It was going to be entirely designed with computation. And we had some, some brilliant minds at AFRL said, just a second, we need to put in a wind tunnel. And we did. And it was pretty fortunate as we learned some physics in the wind tunnel that we had never predicted in any of the codes. Wound up doing a little bit of a redesign. Uh, Air Force and DARPA got into a fight over doing more wind tunnel testing. We wound up not do, doing more wind tunnel testing. We flew it. It failed. So, so I'm a I'm a big fan of the combination of the two. So I think we have good agreement on the the combination, <laughs> the appropriate combination of the tools we have is, is the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that sounds pretty great to me. Um, and happy to uh, be in this field then and be a <laughs> computationalist with doing experiments for, for a portion of the physics at least. 
Um, I have a good uh, question here from uh, Professor Crosley. Uh, that's a broad question for all the panelists. Um, can the panelists provide their thoughts about where university research might provide advantages over uh, defense related work uh, conduct or um, over work conducted? At uh, a DoD research lab, for example, uh, what about university research provides additional value? Um, I guess um, we can start with well, uh, Professor Pani. I'll bring it back to you just briefly since you did work at both AFRL and as a professor now. Um, okay, well, kind of go well, down the line. Yeah, yeah just well, one 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 quick observation is that. Uh, DoD research labs are necessarily very focused on particular aspects of, um, you know, the, the DoD needs, and they have trouble working outside the box, um, whereas university is very unconstrained and can think about things that maybe uh, are unexpected or unrelated to the mainstream that may prove to be, um, you know, uh, outstanding contributions, uh, but um, not uh, in the... Uh, uh, you know, the, the obvious uh, flow of, of technology development. That makes sense. Um, I know, uh, Professor Hanworker, you, you previously worked at uh, NIST. Uh, so would, would you uh, have any insight in comparing your, your experience at NIST versus uh, being in, in, the, in academia for defense? Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, NIST has as, as, as its goal to use U.S. innovation and industrial competitive uh, and improve that by advancing measurement science standards and technologies in ways that promote economic growth and development. So um, NIST had the advantage that you could do short-term research in, in close collaboration with industry and with other parts of the government. In addition, we could also tackle some long-term research so it was that great combination that I think is, um, uh, is as uh, Jonathan just said, maybe some of the DOD labs don't have that advantage to look at some of the, um, the new developments or even develop new things themselves. You know, NIST has a, has a world-renowned uh, quantum computing group. And from that, I think they've won three Nobel Prizes. So NIST has that com that great combination, and even in in metallurgy, material science, uh, we were able to uh, to use that model to make um, changes, to make improvements, both now and in the future. So in transitioning to Purdue, it was actually quite natural to be able to do that. First of all, we all live by funding, right? So. Uh, so we worked with the Department of Defense, Transportation, Energy, uh, et cetera. The only agency that we didn't really work with was NSF. And so uh, by going to, uh, from, from NIST to Purdue, I found that same, um, I guess, uh, esprit de corps at, at Purdue that people really are open to collaboration. They bring their... Uh, their A game to the to the table and to try to do something in um, in support of what the research uh, the research sponsors need, like the Department of Defense. So I think that uh, actually it's a, an excellent uh, transition to be able to have. Awesome. Um... Professor Heaster, I know you do a lot of work with uh, Zucro. Would you, you want to talk a bit about um, the facilities there and uh, what advantages it, they uh, supply for defense research? Oh, well, I, I guess I wanted to dovetail a little bit off of John's uh, answer there uh, uh, to Professor Crossley's uh, question. Oh, I yeah, go ahead. The, the universities do, um, you know, in my mind, uh, it provides for a diversity of thought. Uh, working with young people that don't have uh, inherent internal biases uh, of a large organization is uh, is neat. Um, I'll give you an example. You know, so I, I spent some time at TRW. TRW uh, invented and, uh, and developed rocket engines surrounding a specific type of injector, a pintle injector. So if you went to that organization, you asked them for a new rocket engine, they immediately show you a pintle injector. Uh, and it may not be the right answer for that new rocket engine. Uh, so having a diverse uh, a diverse thought, having people that that don't have internal biases um, 
is is a, a way that new ideas come about. Uh, and one way to generate to generate new ideas. So I thought it was important to to dovetail off of of uh, this discussion. We can come back if you want, um, but I'm sure we need to hear from others. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um. And so we also have uh, Professor Neville, if you want to add in. Sure. I don't know how my research compares to everybody else in the panel because a lot of words that have been said I don't understand <laughs> so far. But in the machine learning space, I think one of the the big advantages in academia is that we often look for abstractions of problems that apply to both DoD specific applications, but other applications that are more benign that can be talked about in an unclassified setting. And so um, being able to formulate a problem that's important to DOD in a very generic way on a public data set that a large set of students and faculty can become interested in and, um, and do their research on really pushes forward research at a pace that um, is not possible with, um, you know, many of the more complicated classified problems that DOD labs are working with. And so in my collaboration with uh, labs where I often have students go for internships, I can't usually even hear about some of the problems, but we'll talk enough to know that I can frame it as some, you know, prediction problem on Twitter with respect to fake news and and they'll say, yes, okay, that sounds good. And then I know that uh, what we're working on is is relevant. So I think that's an important aspect mm -hmm. as well. That's really interesting. Um, I, so um, we have another question uh, from the audience here, which I am going to direct to uh, Dr. Lewis. Um, yeah. from uh, Jacob Green, what what is the likelihood of seeing a hybrid aircraft similar to the Boeing Sugar Volt concept aircraft being used in military capacity in the near future? Hmm. Um. Find near. I'm not sure how you define near future. <laughs> it's always difficult making making predictions about the future. Um. I wouldn't say in the foreseeable future. But yeah, interesting technology. Certainly, certainly worth pursuing. By the way, can I can I jump in on the last conversation? Oh yeah, definitely. So, so I, I'll point out that universities have a make a tremendous contribution because they not only produce top quality research, they also produce students, as other people have alluded. That's also one of the products coming out of university research labs, and that's not to be underestimated. I mean, you know, think about that the infusion of talent into the labs, it, into the rest of academia, into industry. That's that's absolutely critical. So you know, the Department of Defense generally has a formula for basic research. Roughly about 70% of the basic research dollars get spent outside the department, mostly in universities. Only about 30% get spent inside the, the laboratories. That has some beneficial effects. Frankly, it, it helps the labs keep their game up. They're, they're kind of competing with the best and the brightest, and that's important. It also, though, having that much, um, it becomes a forcing function for academia. And I used to say when a, when a program manager at a place like AFOSR or ONR authors a broad agency announcement announcing what the service is interested in, you get the whole of American academia kind of looking at those problems, look at those issues, think about how they can apply what they're doing to that particular area of interest for, for the Department of Defense. So it really is a very, very close relationship and an important relationship. Awesome. Um, so I have um, kind of a, a related question, I guess, to that um, for you and uh, Professor Neville. Uh, so. Um, machine learning is like a, a very big topic right now, particularly in industry, in addition to in defense um, and computer science is a, in general, a field with a variety of career options in the commercial world. So, um, what would you uh, say uh, to a computer science student? Um, why, why should they be interested in working or collaborating with the defense industry as opposed to maybe going somewhere like Google or Intel or something like that? Hmm. Well, I would say that, that we were actually working pretty closely with, with uh, across the industry. Um, when I was in the Pentagon, Intel was one of our closest partners. So, and, and Google as well has has uh, has has uh, worked with the defense. So, so they're not mutually exclusive. Um, but I think that careers in supporting defense activities can be very satisfying. Um, you know, artificial intelligence, great example. Uh, there are so many applications in defense that lend themselves to the capabilities that are enabled by artificial. intelligence. In so many operations that can be enhanced with artificial intelligence. Um, you know, very candidly, I think the elephant in the room is you've got some folks who ask the question, well, will this technology be used in an ethical manner? Will it be used, you know, appropriately? And and the way to make sure that happens is to be part of the conversation. 
be involved in technology development to make sure it is used in the appropriate means. Yeah, I guess I Mark said a lot of the same things that I would say. I think that um, it's it's very difficult to convince uh, computer science students, at least in the MLAI space right now, to go work for anyone other than the big internet companies because they pay a lot of money and they have really big systems and really cool problems to work on. But ultimately, uh, the students that go work there are very small cogs in a very big advertising system. And um, so if you want to have impact on other aspects of life, uh, I think that uh, defense problems are, um, you know, maybe people would disagree with this statement, but I think this is a way to have your work have some impact for social good. And that maybe dovetails with what Mark just said, right? So of course there's people who think some of the applications in defense are, um, you know, not ethical, um, you know, maybe they will be upset of uh, the use of face recognition for widespread surveillance or use of automated weapons um, without any kind of oversight. But this there's really a unique opportunity to go and contribute to that discussion and create secure, robust, um, explainable systems that can really support doing this in a very safe and secure way, which at the same time, there's just such a wide complexity of the problems that are there in defense that I would think that it'd be much, uh, you know, less boring than um, working on a very narrow problem in, in industry. So I actually have a comment. So it's sort of the converse to that. So it's not from the computer science view. What I'm seeing is that there's been a tremendous wave in the last year of my former PhD students, PhD graduates, masters, and undergraduates who are going back to get a uh, degree, uh, a master's degree in computer science, particularly for machine learning. And they see that it's essential for, um, for example, for fabrication, analyzing fabrication in a, uh, in a very large electronics company, that you can't deal with the data anymore in the same way, the same simple ways one did before. So I think we should recognize the importance of uh, uh, data analytics, machine learning, and AI for all of the engineering graduate students. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Even going back to what Jonathan was saying earlier about the simulation and modeling, I part of the collaboration I do with uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab is that they have a whole machine learning team that tries to understand these very large scale simulations when they break down and fail. And that, that's really a, has become a machine learning problem of how to debug the very simulators that you're, you know, I'm not sure if you specifically are using them, but a lot of uh, more engineering and scientists are using to study the questions that they want to study. Um, and so machine learning then becomes a tool to do that better and faster with lower costs. I, I can tell you there was so much enthusiasm about artificial intelligence methods and machine learning in the department. So almost about a, a almost exactly a year ago, I brought on board a new a new principal director for artificial intelligence, Dr. Jill Crisman, who was kind of the senior technology lead for artificial intelligence in in, uh, in, in our office. And, and the first thing I told her was, "All right, get give me a get a site picture, figure out everything the department is doing in artificial intelligence." She showed up in my office about a month later. Well, I'd seen, you know, talked to her in, in the intervening time, but shows up a month later saying, Tell me, this is impossible. There is so much going on. There are so many programs, so many efforts. We can't get a handle on it. It's such a, such a, a vast uh, investment across the department. So, so, you know, echoing those comments, really exciting area to be working in right now. And thanks for all that insight. I didn't realize how widespread uh, it's gotten across all of the different disciplines, not just boxing itself into like generally computer science. Now, by the way, I would also say that's that's why the department really needs people with top level skill sets, because the problem you run into is you have a lot of people who every time they now get a problem, they say, oh, well, we'll solve it with artificial intelligence. <laughs> you know, we'll go to the artificial intelligence store, we'll buy a can of artificial intelligence, we'll sprinkle it on whatever isn't working and voila, it'll start to work. And so having people who really understand the engineering and the science had a had it had a buy its way into to effective systems. I think that's a critical need for the department right now. 
That makes sense to me. Um, we have another audience question here uh, from Jake Green again. Uh, as space becomes more accessible to other nations, what technologies will be important in developing the United States Space Force into an established presence in orbit? So I, I think that's for you, Dr. Lewis. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I don't mean to monopoly. So no problem. So look, we got to move in a couple areas. One, we got to leverage what what the commercial sector is doing. All right. Um, we had a couple, we have one big push in the department. I think it's still important, um, an important direction, which is making space less vulnerable. How do you make it less vulnerable? You proliferate. You got lots of small satellites in orbit. Instead of big giant satellites that are in vulnerable orbits, you do lots of smaller satellites and you leverage what the commercial sector is doing. So that's one. Getting the cost down. That's something that the commercial sector is showing us how to do. But associated with that, it's not enough to just build it, but also launching it. So, so making launch, uh, uh, getting the cost of launch down, making a uh, 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 cost more, uh, making making launch more accessible, are absolutely absolutely key in this. Awesome. So I, I had a related question to that, actually, um, since you mentioned uh, commercial space flight, it, it's been taking off in the recent years. Um, has the increase in uh, private rock companies changed the relationship between universities and DOD sponsors? And has uh, privatization influenced fundamental research, uh, for example, by certain companies keeping things proprietary instead of uh, general uh, knowledge? Oh, you know, I actually haven't seen that. I've seen the opposite. I've seen a number of the companies reaching out to their university partners. Um, you know, we, the department has a number of programs, for example, um, so there's the SBIR program, the small business innovation program, but there's also the STTR, which is just like the SBIR, but it requires the company to partner with the university. And we saw some very robust efforts in the space, the space sector. Um, I'm also going to say a number, number of the space companies weren't falling in that IP trap, if you will. They're being very open about their, their, their technology. Um, some of the smaller ones, some of the bigger ones, you know, SpaceX very famously doesn't do patents. Um, so, so I, I, I think it's actually, it's, it's a, it's a great picture for universities, great opportunities for the university in the space sector right now. And I guess I, I'm going to also, uh, bring that question to, uh, professor Huster as well as the, on the, the, yeah, university I'm, side. I'm interested in, in, uh, in uh, this is obviously broaches my field. It, it's, uh, such an exciting time, you know, there's so much venture capital flowing into this. So many, uh ideas for constellations and uh, spacecraft and, and uh, our students are, are getting tugged uh, in 15 different directions. I think the, uh, you know, we see the, uh, as, as Dr. Lewis pointed out, you know, the, the collaborations enhancing with government, but also I think government is becoming less and less of a factor there. If you look at the dollars that are flowing, you know, a lot of private investment uh, into the field uh, the compression of the uh, of the timelines, you know, the the development timelines, and we see this across. You know, it's I think it's it's uh, for those of us with gray hair, you know, we we notice things happening faster and faster and faster. The acceleration of technology, and this is but one example of it. Uh, you know, you know, in in, in the uh, the space sciences area, space launch area. Uh, such things, of course, as added manufacturing, being able to print an entire rocket engine or injector in one piece in literally hours, uh, which would have taken, you know, maybe a month uh, with uh, traditional technologies. Uh, the, uh, the entire development process is getting compressed. So it's hard to see. It's, uh, you know, it's hard to keep up with, uh, to be honest. You know, I'm reading the news and seeing press releases each day from another new firm that wants to build a rocket. Uh, it's uh, it's daunting. I don't know how folks in the government keep up with it because uh, it's uh, there's just a lot happening. Thanks. Um, we have a, another audience question from Professor Shi. Um, he says, uh, "Mark Lewis listed quantum as a future promise, but not yes. as an emerging technology priority. Uh, since quantum computing and quantum communication, if realized, can make everything that we currently do obsolete." Is quantum still too immature to be a factor? He is wanting to know. Oh, so no, I didn't. I didn't want to leave that impression. Quantum quantum science is very much an emerging technology. It was very much one of our priorities. Um, so, my own perspective, quantum is incredibly promising and can play a very important role, especially quantum sensors, you know, quantum clocks, quantum position navigation and timing. I have to admit, I'm 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 less optimistic about quantum communication. 
um, and, and other things, you know, quantum computing, really exciting, but a long way off, right? So you, you'll, you'll read stories that claim that, you know, quantum computer is on the verge of completely changing the way, you know, way, way we do computing. Yeah, not quite yet. All right, my, my, my quantum friends tell me that you need to have, the, the fundamental unit of a quantum computer is a qubit. It's the quantum equivalent of a bit. It's, it's um, uh, my friends tell me that for a, a meaningful quantum computer, we'll have to have about a million qubits. In order to start solving any, any worthwhile problem, you have to be at at least 100,000 qubits. Uh, Google's quantum computer has 53. But we're not there yet. We're, we're moving in the right direction, but it's not coming tomorrow. Um, you know, we've seen some algorithms that have been developed specifically for quantum computers. There's been this neat little trend, though, Someone will produce an algorithm that works on a quantum computer, and then they'll figure out, oh, wait, this also works in a traditional computer as well. So, so it's, the field is, is kind of helping across the board. Um, quantum, you know, we, 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 I would, I would, you know, we, we, we had push, we had pushes for, you know, quantum key uh, uh, decryption. We had pushes for things like uh, quantum internet, quantum radar. And not a little, not, not the low hanging fruit. I, 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 the department right now is focusing on sensors. That makes sense to me. Um, yeah, quantum is, is going to be a big field. Uh, it's also going to have impacts on uh, security and, and passwords. I'm guessing uh, the DOD is probably also going to be interested in that. Well, you know, it's, it's been, it has been pointed out that QKD, um, you know, quantum cryptography, it's, it's very, it will be very expensive and doesn't actually solve the main problems. So that's why we weren't looking at it as a, as a primary, primary investment area. Maybe at some point in the future. Um, to bring back to uh, hypersonics, um, I have a question for um, you and Professor Prodigy again. Uh, so hypersonics, um, currently a very big field, and it has been big in the past and has kind of, uh, as Professor Schneider has liked to, to mention, um, had a cyclical history um, in terms of funding and support. Um, where, where do you both see the, the future of hypersonics in defense? And is this uh, boom in, in hypersonics uh, going to be different? Another prediction. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jonathan, you want to take that one first? Sure. Well, yeah, this is this is very close to home for me because um, I arrived at the Air Force Research Laboratory, my first day of work. You know, this is sort of circa 1994, 1995, and immediately there was enormous drawdown. Uh, I worked for, worked for a hypersonics uh, team, um, and I've seen several cycles of this. And if we had just taken the average of the uh, uh, available resources and provided that as a constant stream, we would be in a better position today. So um, I, we can, I think we can expect cycles to come, but uh, we should really plan for a uh, long-term investment in this technology, both in terms of national assets like wind tunnels, but also in human capital uh, and, and pursue this for a long time so even if you know it goes up and down, that we keep uh, a finite level of uh, investment in this area, because it will really be important for a long time, and uh, there are other people working on it. So uh, you know, one thing that makes me uh, optimistic about the future of research in this area is our competitors are really good, and uh, they light the fire under you know the uh, uh, the government to uh, uh, to keep uh, you know to keep work going in this area. So uh, I'm, I'm relatively optimistic, but I do I, I do brace myself for the the next downturn in in this area. Yeah, so I'll I'll I'll, I'll agree. You know, I I would get that question often. So, is it this? If, is it different this time? So so it does hypersonics has had about a 15 year cycle, and I also I finished up as a, I finished my PhD in 1988. It was the middle of the National Aerospace Plane Program. Money was flowing freely. I show up at the university. I will say this by the way. University funding, especially the fundamental level, is always kind of it never came to a complete stop. And I, you know, I hats off to there are some folks at NASA, some folks at AFOSR, especially and connect working with AFRL that kind of kept the universities moving, moving in hypersonic. Um, I do think it's different this time. And Jonathan's got it exactly right. A couple of factors. Um, one is we've got competitors now. We 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 didn't realize we were in a race. We're in a race, and it's a race we can't lose. And two, the, this general recognition. That um, you know, this is this is absolutely critical to 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 the future of defense. I mean, I mentioned in my talk earlier, we have done war games where if the United States does not have hypersonic capability, we don't win the war. It's as simple as that. Um, and so I think that's that's driving a lot of it. Now we would 
be doing this tech, pursuing this technology, even if others weren't, because it, I think it's an important technology. But 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 that's certainly a a, a strong motivating factor. Thanks. That's uh, that's good to hear as well. Um, so, uh, kind of a, a little more uh, specific for um, Professor Handwerker. Uh, since you you work in material science, uh, a big issue for hypersonics is uh, high surface heating. Is, is there uh, are there any innovations coming in, in material science that are uh, working to handle that? So yes, there are innovations with respect to um, uh, high surface heating. But let's take a step back and look at. Three other issues. One is it's a high performance, high vibration environment. So you've got high temperature, um, high mechanical stresses, uh, and uh, lots of vibration. The other thing you have is long term storage. So we also have to look at reliability when these, with some of these uh, systems, may be stored, hopefully. I believe for 20 years before they're being called upon to be used. So we have to keep all of these different dimensions in mind when we're developing new technologies. So there, so my field is in microelectronics. So the new technologies that uh, get away from solder, solder is a low melting point uh, material. There are new designs that are cropping up. So these kinds of, all of these technologies bring challenges because it, in many cases, they haven't been used in uh, commercial systems yet. So there are many materials uh, challenges. In addition, the whole material sets may change. So it's not just you know tweaking a a solder or tweaking a circuit board somewhere that we may have to have vastly uh, different designs. So those are challenges and opportunities that I think we're pretty well prepared for. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, I hadn't considered some of those other aspects of it. Um, I have a question here from the chat. Uh, so, Professor or, or Dr. Lewis, you were mentioning um, during your lecture previously uh, about how important it is to um, it, to build the workforce and to, to train students, including foreign students as well, and to potentially like look into more of giving them a green card and help them stay. Do you have any comments about? Um, ITAR preventing international graduate students from applying to, to some of the most interesting jobs in aerospace research or doing graduate research in general, because there are some ITAR projects that go on here at Purdue. Um, is, and uh, the, the question from the chat is asking, is ITAR appropriate and relevant today? Hmm. So, you know, I would say there, there, are, there are no simple, easy answers. You kind of get two ends of the spectrum. You get the one end that says there should be no ITAR, ITAR, no limitations, throw the gates wide open. Then there's the school of thought that says, you know, lock it all down. Don't let anyone who is the U.S. citizen see it, touch it, hear about it. I would argue either of those responses is wrong. There has to be a common middle ground. There has to be a common sense. Um, you know, I, I think I mentioned my talk. One, one of our great strengths in the United States is that we work with our allies and our partners. So, so let me throw out some numbers. So. So, coming out of World War II, the Department of Defense accounted for about half of all S&T investment in the United States. The United States accounted for about half of all S&T investment around the world. So that meant that the Pentagon was overseeing about 25% of the total world investment in S&T. Different ways to measure it, so those numbers are approximate. All right, but that was coming out of World War II. Fast forward to today, 2021. Department of Defense is maybe about 3.5% of total investment. All right, so we have to leverage what other people are doing. Now, if you, if you break that down and say, all right, so let's just open the aperture wider. Let's ask how much of the S&T investment across the world is coming from the United States, not just defense, just everything from the United States. About 27%, 26, 27%. China is really close. China is coming up right behind us. They're about 25, 26%. They say, oh crap, that's that's really bad. They're almost where we are. And then, you know, they, they, their cost of doing business often can be much lower than ours. Except here's the good news. You now look at all the countries below China, the, the next six countries down the list, they're all U.S. allies. They're the Euro European nations, Germany, France, England, the European Union as a whole, South Korea. Uh, you know, you, you look at the partnerships we have around the world. That's our strength. We have to nourish those. Um, I'll also talk, let me, let me also point out, you know, the strength of our, of, of our scientific ecosystem. So last year, the department uh, announced uh, its, its award winners in something called the Vannevar Bush uh, Faculty Fellowship. It's the most prestigious faculty fellowship the depart that the Department of Defense gives. 
it picks select faculty members who work on problems of relevance to the department. Um, in the most recent cohort, the vast majority of the faculty members who got that award were foreign born. So, um, actually, looking at, looking at their backgrounds, it, you know, it, it's hard to tell exactly what someone's background is, but it was pretty obvious that that was, you know, uh, across the board. That's the strength of our system. The best and the brightest come to study in the United States. If that ever stops being the case, if students stop wanting to come to study in the United States, want to go elsewhere, that's when we are truly having problems. That would be a warning sign. So again, it's a it's a situation. It, it's it's something that requires balance. We have a related question from the audience as well. Um, so the U.S. has a long history of collaboration with allies abroad in defense research, as you were just talking about. Um, are there any specific areas in which uh, we should pursue stronger defense partnerships with our international allies in either space, hypersonics, or otherwise? Um, well, one would be space. The other would be hypersonics. <laughs> the other would be otherwise. Yes, to all of the above. Look, you know, remember, the United States has less than 5% of the world's population. There are smart people all around the world. We have to work with all. And we find that if you look, you look at various nations, even sometimes small countries will have really a great expertise in, in a focused area. Um, Singapore, for example. So Singapore has some of the best modeling of human physiology of any, any, of, of any nation in the world. And, we, and the U.S. has worked with them in modeling, say, response of pilots in, in injector seats, trying to figure out what the physiological response would be to, to high stress. Um, in hypersonics, you know, Australia is an incredibly valued partner. They bring so much to the table. Um, you know, the development of some of the test facilities that we talked about. Well, there's a, there's a type of wind tunnel that we use in hypersonics called a stalker tube, named for Professor Ray Stalker. He was a professor at University of Queensland. It was his invention. The Australians actually flew arguably the very first hypersonic jet engine, supersonic combustion ram jet engine. It was a project that was funded out of the University of Queensland called High Shot, which not only shows what a foreign partner can do, it shows what a university can do in advancing technology. So yes to all of the above, and, 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 and frankly, we had a, the department has a very robust engagement across the board. Um, I'd also say that's something that the universities can play a big role in, because universities are a melting pot, and, uh, and, and, and often will interact with, with international partners in ways that go above and beyond what, say, the government laboratories do, or even in, what industry partners can do. That's really neat to hear, and I, I um, actually, uh, just to kind of add a comment on that, I, I, um, interacted with a bunch of faculty members from around the world uh, at various like conferences, and it's always been very interesting hearing what they're working on and the, their unique facilities that they have in their countries versus ours, and how we collaborate. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely, awesome. Um, so we we have about five minutes left. Uh, it looks like. Um, and so if anyone else has any questions, I, I don't see any more audience questions. I have a, a general question um, that anyone can answer here. Um, so, uh, and this is related to the final question um, from the, uh, the lecture earlier today. Um, how can students who are interested in working in defense related jobs uh, start to prepare while they're in college or graduate school before they, they start applying elsewhere? So should we leave that to oh, other members of the panel? <laughs> oh, yeah, so we, we, we can start. How, how about we start with uh, Professor Prati? Okay, so the, um, the question is how to, how to uh, prepare to get a job in the defense sector or how to prepare, uh, you know, for, for work. Yes, if uh, you're a current uh, undergraduate or graduate student and you want yeah. to work in defense, what, what should you be doing now uh, to, to sort of optimize your chances of, of getting such a job. Yeah, I, I think, uh, for example, if you're in graduate school, you should look for a professor who has close contacts with uh, defense, the defense establishment. So, for example, we have uh, a lot of ongoing um, grants and contracts with the Air Force Research Laboratory, and we have a huge number of opportunities to say go visit there for the summer. Uh, you know, the same same thing with uh, we've worked with the Army Research Laboratory, and they're just very very eager to get students to come. Be summer visitors, you know, as soon as COVID is over, they won't be virtual anymore. And um, uh, so there, there's a real uh, hunger in the defense establishment to bring in some new talent. And, you know, this brings in this issue of the aging workforce. So for many years, uh, I was the young person in the office at AFRL, and uh, they're in that same kind of situation, uh, situation now. And, uh, you know, there's this need to replace the uh, Cold War era generation with a new generation. So just making contact, uh, developing contacts in, in the establishment uh, is a good place to start.
I don't know, Liz, if you wanted uh, us to add to that, or I, you know, uh, Dr. Paji has the right answer. I think uh, those who are doing uh, doing work with the Department of Defense have connections there, and it's a natural uh, natural route uh, to uh, to establishing contacts. Uh, the summer programs have sent a number of students to uh, to spend the summer in Dayton uh, or uh, various uh, government labs, and uh, to gain to gain some experience and. Uh, you know, to establish a relationship. Right? Once uh, you spent some time there, people know you and uh, become familiar with you, uh, then they're generally wanting you to become one of the team. <laughs> awesome. Uh, this is Carol Handworker. I have, yeah. a, I have a, um, an example of um, how we um, sort of break that mold where it's one-on-one -on -one or send students to um, uh, through our own personal contacts. So Purdue is the lead in a new workforce development program with the Department of Defense. It's called Scalable Asymmetric Life Cycle Engagement Program. And so we're partnering with 14 other universities and with agencies, all DOD agencies and the Defense Industrial Base to provide a curriculum that is microelectronics uh, specific. So they get they get some things even in their first year, first year engineering, their core courses, and then take special classes. They get engaged in research, and the DOD and the Defense Industrial Base are providing uh, internships for those students, and we're tracking that uh, as well uh, with the number of jobs that are available. So the so the agencies are actually looking for students with particular skill sets, including radiation hardening. You mentioned that before, uh, Mark, and it's a key issue across the Department of Defense. So radiation hardening, heterogeneous integration, advanced packaging, system on chip, supply chain, and embedded systems. So, so this is a, a different way of doing it. So we have these partnerships, we're co-teaching classes, and it's been well, well supported uh, both uh, financially and also um, in terms of engagement with the Department of Defense. Thanks. Um, so, uh, Professor Neville, I'll give you a chance to add on to that question, and then we have two quick questions for Dr. Lewis before we close up here. <laughs> Oh, I would just uh, say in the machine learning space, if you're a U.S. citizen and you want to be involved, all you have to do is like hold up your hand and everybody will jump on. You. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, besides the other statements of, uh, you know, t t talking with people to get internships, I think that's a great way. I would just say for Purdue students, a lot of the DOD lab people I know will show up at our um, the recruiting events, the roundtables um, on campus. And that's a great way to go and start talking to people um, and you know, making contacts yourself. Um, so other than that, I don't have anything to add to what everybody else has already said. Awesome. So, um, uh, Dr. Lewis, the question, uh, the first question we had, um, since we don't have anyone, uh, any faculty member particularly focused on directed energy research right now, um, a member of the audience wants to know uh, what areas or focuses are best places to start for finding open research and uh, what locations are best for student research in the in directed energy? Oh, gosh, you know, there, look. So, first, I, I, I actually don't know if that's true. Um, you know, I, I think if you look across uh, the college of engineering, College of Engineering at Purdue, I, I would be surprised if you didn't actually find some people who are working very heavily in the field. Oh, I apologize. I meant for this panel specifically. Oh, for this panel. Oh, yeah, oh, sorry. okay. I was going to say. I mean, no, no, you know, no. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, you know, there are so many different areas that you can work in direct energy. Um, optics, obviously, really important. Fundamental physics. Um, there, there are engineering aspects of direct energy. Um, uh, you know, I've got friends on the space side who are looking at using direct energy in space. So really lots of things you can do. I, I actually, you know, I, I was an aerospace engineer. My, my first graduate work was in using lasers for flow visualization. So I actually became a laser guy as a, as a, as a master's student. So again, uh, really rich opportunities in, in any of the top universities, any of the top programs, I think. You know, would be good. By the way, I, I did want to add, you know, there are financial opportunities for students who want to work in defense. There are fellowships, for example, the NDSEG fellowship. Um, the uh, the uh, the smart scholarship, uh, which which really create uh, financial incentives. I mean, they're they're really good programs to get people working in the in the government laboratories. So students should be looking for those as well. 
But yeah, I, I should mention I, I am an NDSEG fellow, so uh, that has been a great opportunity for me for my, my graduate studies. Um, and final question uh, for you, Dr. Lewis, uh, from the audience is, uh, what's your opinion on F-35? Is it uh, too big to shut down, a failure, or a success? <laughs> oh, man. Let me see. I, I can tell you how I used to be able to answer, how I couldn't answer that when I was in the Pentagon. So look, you know, the F-35 was an incredibly ambitious program. And when it started, um, it began as an ambitious program. Yeah, I mean, we knew it was an ambitious program. Um, it's obviously had some fits and starts along the way, as you, 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 you maybe should have anticipated. Um, I, I've got some of my own frustrations with the program. I, I, I personally think there should have been a second engine for the F-35. F um, there were, we, we had historical examples of what happens when you don't have the, you know, other, other propulsion options available for an aircraft. And, and I, I'd like to see that one, uh, uh, corrected. Um, you know, the program is, I have no doubt the program will eventually get to where it needs to be. It's just been a little bit more painful than it could have been. Awesome. Thanks for that. So that that's the last audience question we have now, and it is four o'clock. So I'm going to uh, pass off control here back to Professor DeLaurentis for some conclusions. And thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Lewis, and all of the panel members for your time and answers here. Well, uh, I just want to add my thanks as well. Uh, Mark, you've been very generous with your time and your thoughts, uh, not only, of course, uh, for this session and today, but throughout your service. So uh, I know you're always eager to get it back to what you probably love the best, which is the academic setting. So thank you very much to you and to the panelists. Yeah. Thank you.